Welcome to the PR Maven podcast, a podcast all about growing your network and building your brand through traditional and digital networking techniques. I'm Nancy Marshall, the PR Maven and CEO of Marshall Communications. Stay tuned for this week's episode and thanks for listening. Welcome PR Maven Nation to this week's episode, one of our mini episodes, a quick and informative look at how to write, pitch, and place op-ed columns. The podcast is presented by Marshall Communications, creator of the 65-step Marshall Plan process. For more information, visit marshallpr.com. And on the website under PR Maven, you will also find information about my two books, PR Works and Grow Your Audience, Grow Your Brand. This week, I will be sharing one of my recent main biz columns, how to write, pitch, and place op-ed columns. So let's dive right in. If you work in public relations, you're bound to know what an op-ed means. Even if you don't, you've probably come across one, perhaps without even knowing it. An op-ed column refers to a piece of written content that is traditionally opposite the editorial page of a newspaper. It is an article written by a subject matter expert as a form of commentary, taking a stand on a particular issue and informing readers in the process. Because it is a commentary piece with a particular slant, an op-ed is separate from a news story, which should be an objective piece of reporting, at least in theory. People in the PR industry understand op-eds and their value because they work with clients to draft, pitch, and place them. By place, I mean submit an op-ed to a news outlet that then accepts the submission, securing a placement. Through op-eds, clients can position themselves as thought leaders, leveraging a news cycle to bring their subject matter expertise directly to readers. That thought leadership needs to be legitimate and topical, providing content to the targeted audience in a timely manner. We call it newsworthy in the PR business. For example, op-eds on Ukraine and inflation are newsworthy right now. Those are two news hooks that are important to readers. So thought leaders who are qualified to opine on them are perfectly positioned to have relevant content published. Opinion editors judge that content on its merits, choosing to publish it or not, but newsworthy submissions always stand a better chance than those not tied to current events. Now you may be thinking, why are op-eds even important in the first place? Well, they obviously demonstrate thought leadership allowing clients to stand out and draw attention. But on top of that, the opinion page of a newspaper can be the most popular and widely read piece of that publication. To quote former New York Times editor, Herbert Bayard Swope, who is considered the grandfather of the op-ed, nothing is more interesting than opinion when opinion is interesting. In some cases, op-eds can generate millions and even tens of millions of reads. They can even influence public policy, especially with national publications like the New York Times. The opinion page is prime real estate from a readership perspective. So how do you reach readers? First, you need to brainstorm a topic, developing an idea that is tied to a relevant news cycle. The news hook can be a recent event, holiday, or something else, but there needs to be one. Here are four components of an op-ed. After you brainstorm an op-ed topic, it's time to draft the piece. Op-eds are generally broken down into four components, the lead, pivot, argument, and conclusion. The lead should include the news hook, which explains why the argument is timely in the first place. 
Getting to the argument requires a pivot from the lead to the main talking points, which are then summarized in the conclusion at the end. Ideally, the talking points will include facts and figures, key statistics and so forth, empirical evidence that can back up your rhetoric. All in all, op-eds generally range between 500 and 800 words total. They are pithy and quick hitting, but also substantive. They can be shorter or longer based on a particular news outlet, but I generally consider a 600 word piece to be the sweet spot. Readers can have limited attention spans, so it's better to be short and sweet with your writing. For instance, I try to keep my paragraphs to five sentences at most. Once the drafting process is complete, then it's time to edit, edit, and edit some more. This is very important. The best op-eds go through multiple phases of editing since a first draft is rarely acceptable, acceptable for publication, or as PR professionals call it, placeable. I edit first for substance, second for style, and third just to proofread all of the content. You never want to pitch op-eds with grammar or spelling mistakes. That will reflect poorly back on you. After editing comes pitching, actually reaching out to opinion editors with a final product. But first, you need to ask who is the target audience and what does the target audience read? Let's say that your op-ed has to do with federal legislation being considered in Washington, D.C. With that in mind, The Hill is an example of a news outlet that may be interested in this submission. Securing that placement could reach the most relevant readership. Therefore, you would identify the Hill's opinion editor and send them the piece, introducing it with a pitch of two or three sentences followed by the content itself. If the Hill says yes, then your job is done. The placement has been secured and you can share the published version with your client. But if not, you need to look elsewhere and keep pitching opinion editors until one finally accepts the submission. In this case, news outlets like Roll Call and Real Clear Politics could be other options to consider. The key is making the pitch, including the op-ed itself, as compelling as possible. So opinion editors have no choice but to say yes. Then it's all about patience and persistence. Be patient until an op-ed placement has been secured. Trust your process, but persistently try to achieve the final outcome of publication. After all, your job isn't done until the op-ed is published and read. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Don't forget to get a free coveted PR Maven things to do today pad by visiting prmaven.com slash giveaway. Fill out the form to submit your mailing address so we can send you a to-do pad in the mail. That's the real mail, like in your mailbox. <laughs> now here are Lori Duby and Tyler Goddard to share how my book, Grow Your Audience, Grow Your Brand, has helped Sprague and Curtis Real Estate. Sprague and Curtis is a locally owned real estate company. We're primarily focused in central Maine. Uh, I got excited about Nancy's book because she's so well known in the area for her marketing and branding techniques and uh, we're always looking to expand and learn and grow and um, so a lot of us here at the office decided that we wanted to uh, read her book and learn some new techniques. It benefits Sprague and Curtis to have a large brand and audience um, because there can often be uh, multiple years between transactions with clients, um, so it's important to network them with them and, and stay in touch with them in those in-between periods. And this book really helped us uh, learn some techniques and methods to, to continue to do that. We organized a small book group with Nancy's book uh, with brokers in our office this winter to share information and remind ourselves how important it is to always be working on our network and continually reaching out to our customers. Platforms like social media are important in expanding your business, but equally as important are handwritten notes, cards, letters, 
She inspired me to send her a note of appreciation, just thanking her for the book and her insight. In reading Nancy's book, I was excited to look to continue to grow our brand and our audience. I think she does a great job of um, motivating us. Nancy's book really helped me learn a few things in marketing and branding and how important it is to stay on top of reaching out to clients periodically, staying top of mind, providing useful information, and, and really telling our story as a company. Thanks for listening to this episode of the PR Maven podcast. I invite you to share a review of the podcast on iTunes or your favorite podcast player. Be sure to subscribe to our podcast so you never miss an episode. You can also join the PR Maven Nation on Facebook. It's free to join and it's a great community of like-minded individuals who are all looking to learn and grow from one another. If you use an Alexa device, use your Alexa app to search the skills and games section to find and enable the PR Maven podcast flash briefing. This will give you access to exclusive content and more PR and marketing advice. Thanks again for listening and have a great rest of your week, PR Maven Nation.